Welcome to Unit 6 of the Bio 193A course called Control of Microbial Growth. And we are going to look at antimicrobial effect and also how to measure or how to uh, quantitate this antimicrobial and particularly antibacterial effect. And whenever we are looking at how these antimicrobials or specifically antibacterials act, we can look at two kinds of actions, bactericidal and bacteriostatic. Bactericidal refers to damage, a direct damage that is going to result in the microbes dying. So for example, anything damaging the cell wall or the cell membrane is going to result in cells bursting. So this is going to be a very direct and usually fast action. And then we have bacteriostatic action, which means that it prevents the microbes from growing. So this could be, for example, affecting protein synthesis or a synthesis of other important metabolites of the cells. So it usually can uh, be a little bit of a slower action. <clears throat> and just reminding you that the um, antibacterial components are going to act on different parts, different structures of the bacterial cell. And many of these um, structures or processes will be very unique to the bacterial cell, which means that they are going to be good targets. So for example, we have a large group of antibiotics acting on the cell wall, and that's going to include penicillins and other um, agents that are going to interfere somehow in the structure or in the construction of the cell wall. There are also agents that act directly on the plasma membrane. Then a very important target is the ribosomes. You may remember that we talked how ribosomes in prokaryotes are different from ribosomes in eukaryotes, which means that <clears throat> drugs affecting prokaryotic ribosomes will affect uh, protein synthesis, which means that the cells will be unable to grow, but is not affecting the eukaryotic cells, or in our case, the human cells. There are also antibiotics act acting on specific metabolic pathways, being the, the most common, the folic acid synthesis, which is a, uh, a vitamin. And we humans need to take folic acid. We cannot make it ourselves, but bacteria can make it, and the sulfur drugs interfere in the synthesis of this acid, and also particularly for mycobacteria would be the synthesis of mycolic acid, which is necessary for the uh, acid fast cell wall. And last but not least, there are also um, antibiotics targeting synthesis of nucleic acid, DNA, or RNA uh, synthesis. So, uh, how do we do antibiotic testing? Very often there is an infection and the doctor, the health personnel, must figure out which uh, antimicrobial agent an organism is susceptible to. And for that reason, you can use a variety of methods. I'm going to talk briefly about dilution testing which is a test to figure out what is called the minimal <clears throat> inhibitory concentration. So the minimum inhibitory concentration of MIC is the amount of antimic the minimal amount, the lowest amount of antimicrobial agent necessary to inhibit or kill the bacteria. And then we will talk more in detail about the Kirby Bauer agar diffusion method, which is a pretty standard way to determine antimicrobial susceptibility. So in dilution test, um, and this can be done in tubes, as you can see in the figure, or also in plates, um, there will be different dilutions of this antimicrobial or antibiotic added to the um, bacterial suspension. And then you look at the lowest dose that prevent the growth of the, uh, of the bacteria. So as you can see on the diagram, we start with um, 2, 4, 8, 16, and 32 microgram per mil. And you can see at 2 and 4, which is very low concentration, the bacteria is still growing, the, the broth is turbid, but starting at 8, 
um, there is a clarity. So the minimum inhibitory concentration in this case would be 8 microgram per milliliter. Um, there is a way to determine the minimal bactericidal concentration, which would be to take these um, bacteria that have been exposed to the antibiotic and it place them in a fresh medium without the antibiotic. And then if they grow, then we know that they are still alive. So the, um, the action of the uh, antibiotic was bacteriostatic. But if you place them in fresh medium without the antibiotic and they don't grow, that means that they are dead. So in that case, we know that the concentration or the action was bactericidal. Okay, it's not shown here in the figure, but that would be an additional step to, to figure out if it's bacteriostatic or bactericidal. Just the minimum inhibitory concentration just tells you that inhibits the growth, but we don't know if it's killing or not. Let's talk about Kirby Bauer. So um, the way it works is that you prepare what is called a bacterial lawn. So that is a spread, spread plate. And um, then you play off the organism in question. So that could be a culture from, you know, a sample from a patient. It could be from the saliva, could be from a wound, uh, etc. And then uh, antibiotics, um, antibiotic discs are placed on the surface of that plate. So these are commercially available. They come with a specific dose in them. And then what you measure is what is called the inhibition zone. So if you look at this picture here, you can see that there is a clearing, a big circle of, um, of clearing around most of the antibiotics, which means that that antibiotic was able to inhibit the growth of the bacteria, which don't know if it's, again, if it's bactericidal or not. You can see that that circle is very large in some cases and in others it's very small. And then, so that means that the diameter of zonal inhibition is proportional. So the larger the diameter, the, the uh, bigger the inhibitory effect is. Now, in order to correlate it to a clinical um, effect, we need to do one more step. But let me just um, show you this slide. So this talks about the specific ways as how this antibiotic testing this is. So um, again, you can impregnate this filter disc with a um, with the agent, but usually they are um, bought commercially. And then the agar that is used for this, the medium that is used for Kirby Bauer is a special medium called the Muller Hinton agar. And then you put the discs on the plate, you incubate them for overnight or 24 hours, and then you will be measuring the diameter of those um, inhibition zones, but then you have to look at that antibiotic sensitivity chart. So how do you read this? Let's say that you tested a number of antibiotics against this, let's say, um, I don't know, a, a culture, let's say, from the lungs, and you measure the diameter of zonal inhibition. So let's say, let's look at amoxicillin. So you see that amoxicillin has two lines. One says staph and the other says other. So what this means is that if, if you want, uh, if you're looking at the staphylococcus infection, the zone of um, inhibition, the diameter should be at least 20 millimeters. And if it's any other bacterium, it can be a little bit less. So in order for that antibiotic to be considered effective against that particular culture, it has to be at least 20 millimeters in the case of the Staphylococcus or more than 18 in any other bacterium. So as you measure and as you can see in in, that case, in the case of staph, there is no other option. It's either 20 and then it's susceptible or anything that 19 or less would be 
um, resistant. And then in others, you can see also what is called intermediate. So that means that, let's say, chloramphenicol. So if the inhibition zone is 12 or less millimeters, then that bacterium is resistant to chloramphenicol. If it's between 13 and 17, then it's intermediate, so it's slightly susceptible, while over 18, then it's susceptible. So if you were given a, um, a chart of different antibiotic inhibition zones, you always have to look for the uh, susceptible zone because that would be the uh, antibiotic that would work. So um, again, you can interpret it qualitatively, resistant, intermediate, and susceptible. And then um, the number, usually the bigger the number, the larger the number, the, the more sensitive it is, but it's going to depend on the bacterium and on the antibiotic. Um, and another example here, ampicillin is an effective antimicrobial agent for enterics. Those are the gram-negative rods, such as E. coli, and most streptococcus with a zone of inhibition greater than 16, while for staphylococcus it must be greater than 28. So, um, and something similar is done when you are testing disinfectants. So in the case of disinfectants, you would be applying the chemicals to a sterile filter paper disc, you add them to an agar plate inoculated with a bacterium, and then in this case, we don't have that clinical correlation that we, or tables that we have for the, um, for antibiotics. It's usually just you look at larger zones, typically correlate to, um, to more effectiveness of a chemical agent. And um, here is actually, I believe that I probably took this picture from the, uh, from the lobster lab. So again, you have the, uh, the, Kirby, the, the plate to the left with the circles around, and then you will be measuring with you know, a ruler the diameter of zone inhibition. Remember, it's expressed in millimeters, and then you would be um, comparing it to the table. And um, how do you choose an effective disinfectant? And, and this is something that in the, in the lab search simulation, you know, it goes through a number of different agents. Well, um, you know, the concentration of disinfectant is important. Um, for some cases, you may need to use a higher concentration or, or less concentration, and some of them will work and others won't. So, for example, with alcohol. Alcohol is a great disinfectant, usually starting around 50, but the best concentration is 70%. Um, more than that is not going to increase the disinfectant effect. And actually, if you use pure 100% ethanol, that's not going to be effective. Um, the presence of organic matter, there are a number of disinfectants that are um, inhibited by the presence of organic matter, for example, quads, quaternary ammonium salts. So there are certain uh, let's say, situations when you may have like a bucket or a container full of a disinfectant and you are adding their instruments or other materials that have organic material. Well, you are, you need to change that disinfectant on a regular uh, schedule. Otherwise, the accumulation of that organic matter may, you know, make the whole disinfectant, disinfection process um, moot, so it's not going to work. Uh, pH, so some agents are going to be sensitive to the pH of the environment. The time is important. Actually, the time very often will depend on, for example, temperature. So the colder the temperature, the longer you need to keep those disinfectants working. And, um, microorganisms. So there are microbes that are more sensitive or more resistant than others. And particularly, you may recall endospores. 
that are very hard to kill. So in the case of endospores, you will need longer times or more or stronger agents, maybe a higher concentration of them. And this is the end of the Unit 6 mini lecture for Bio 193A. Thank you.